Hello, everyone, and welcome to the RC Plane Lab podcast. I'm Ron. And I'm Tom. Hey, we're going to give away a radio. That's exciting. It is our, exciting. Our first giveaway. Our like, first giveaway. It's going to be kind of cool. So what is it, Tom? So it's a, it's a FlySky FS6i six-channel radio that I got on Amazon for the paltry sum of $48.72. That's that's actually a good deal. <laughs> well, I you know, on doing some of the research for our last episode on on saving money in the hobby, I came across this radio and I I couldn't not buy it. I mean, a six channel radio with uh, with all these features, uh, programming, EPA, uh, exponential, all this kind of stuff that most modern six channel computer radios have for less than fifty dollars. I had to buy it, so I'm going to thrash it. We're going to do a review of it, and then uh, we're going to give it away. So hopefully we'll be doing some more of these in the future. Yeah. Um, I like giveaways. I think it's kind of fun. I, yeah, I do too. Um, and besides that, like I already have enough stuff at home. <laughs> so if I can play with something for a little while and then pass it on, if it's something really cool to someone else to use, then so much the better. Yeah, I agree. Oh, and uh, look forward to a video on our channel, a full-on review of the radio, unboxing and me thrashing with it in one of my airplanes. Uh, maybe we'll get some video footage of that to put in the in the video as well. Um, yeah, I, I plan on really, really putting this thing through its paces. I, I think it's going to be fun. And I look forward to, hopefully we can do more of this kind of thing in the future. Um, hopefully. Yeah, I like giving <laughs> things away. If you're watching us on YouTube, you can see our background is the Ford Trimotor plans we are going to be using. Um, it's Tom, a monster. <laughs> it's it a is. monster. So Tom picked out plans that were 78-inch wingspan, and we're going to enlarge that by 150%, and that's going to take us up to about 117-inch wingspan, give or take. It's going to be big. It's going to be huge. <laughs> I shouldn't say huge. It's going to be big, but not like extremely, extremely huge. Well, I mean, it'll be the biggest airplane I've ever built. It will be... And to me, that's huge. That, well, it is. It's good size. <laughs> It'll be fun. So, I don't know if we're going to be able to stick with this, but our tentative uh, tri-motor goal completion date is going to be June 1st of 2022. Now, I know what some folks might be thinking now, after like 18 months of them having to listen to us blather on and on and on <laughs> about the Ford tri-motor. Tri yeah. I promise... Uh, Moving forward, all of our updates will be meaningful and short. Should to I the not point. have said that? <laughs> I, mean, I don't know if you can do anything short. Meaningful well, and to the point. I do tend to talk a lot. <laughs> so, yeah, we're not just going to waste your time talking about this every episode. Right. It's just going to be one of those things when we get time to work on it, we're going to do it. There are some things that we need to do first yes. before we can actually start on this in earnest. Right. Um, and we're going to have to figure some stuff out before we actually do it, too. Yep. So, having said that, the first step is finished. We found the plans. Yep. So... I guess we can click the start button on the project. I mean, the, the clock is ticking. And I'm hoping we will get it done a lot sooner than 18 months. That would be nice. But that's going to be our, our drop dead date, drop dead date. That's going to be our end date that we're yeah. going to stick to. You um, know, we have a lot, of, a lot of work to do. We have a lot to figure out. <laughs> so let's kind of walk through, I guess, a few things that we're going to have to do on this. Okay. Since we changed the size... Dr and drastically, drastically change the size. <laughs> um, we're going to need to try and stick with like the the standard Woodstock sizing. Yep. Um, because of how much bigger we made it, obviously all of the cutouts and everything that's designed for is not the correct size anymore. Right. Uh, so it won't work. That's um, kind of a yeah, kind of a, a byproduct of enlarging a plan is you take those standard sizes that the plan was drawn with, and you're enlarging those too, and. The, the size you end up with may or may not have accurately sized um, notches, for example, in the wing ribs for the spars. However, that's actually pretty easy to change since we're doing it on the laser cutter and we're designing the parts and going to be scanning them in um, and cutting them on the laser. Mm -hmm. We can fix that before we cut anything. Which is also something we need to work on before the project. Making the laser Making bigger. The laser bigger. Um, yeah, that's the next actual project before we start on this. But I don't think that's going to be terrible. Um, I, I would think I'd be able to have that done in a month or so. So I think that's reasonable. We'll see how it goes. I just yep. got to get on it. And now that we're done with the duelists, I'll have more <laughs> time to work on other things. Yes. Um, so, yeah, since the plan started at 78 inches, I don't think everything is going to scale correctly 
for what we need. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think we're shooting for a, an overall span of somewhere in the vicinity of 120 ish inches, something th- bigger. Yeah, maybe a little bit take. bigger. Give or take. We'll give see take. how it. <laughs> we'll see what it ends up like. You know, we might. Of course, have Ron to, wants to go much bigger, but we are limited by our engines, and we'll talk about that later. But yeah, yeah if we have the engines for it, we're going to go bigger. Um, yes, we are. But I do 120 inch at least. I don't want to go any smaller than that. Well, and that's a nice round number. Ten foot. You can say yeah. I've got a ten foot trimotor. I don't like. I'm so excited to see that. <laughs> I, I can't, can't wait. Um, the other thing that's yeah. exciting about this is it's our first scale build. It really is, um, and and I would call this a scratch build. Um, I mean, we are going to build this from plans, but we are going to be designing the plans that we're going to be building from. So that puts this in kind of, in my opinion, a scratch build category. And I have never scratch built a scale. Uh, project. So this will be a first for me too. Well, we're changing a lot around on the plans. Yeah. Like really we're using the plans kind of as just a basis, not right. as a, like a finished kind of thing. Yeah. Um, since it's going to be a scale build and we're kind of excited about it, right. we're going to be putting a cockpit in it. Yep. Uh, we're going to be putting the cabin in. Yep. Uh, so a I'll fully be fully furnished cabin. Fully furnished cabin. Yeah. So yeah. we'll be, we'll be 3d printing seats and, and whatever else is inside of the airplane. Yep. Like I think, I remember when we flew in the one we flew in. I think there were like wall sconces um, mm-hmm. that were on the on the walls and stuff when you walked in that kind of yeah. you know hung off the wall. Yeah, yeah. I think it'd be neat to put those in and actually get them to light up. Oh, that would be cool. So, and speaking of lighting, of course, we're going to want landing lights and the and the anti collision lights and a beacon if they had one. So yeah, we're gonna we're gonna go all out on that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think for something like that, it's going to be easiest to use like an Arduino to control all the lights. Yeah. But we might find something simpler or I don't know. That's all that's, you, buddy. You're the programmer. <laughs> that's something we're <laughs> going to have to figure out down the line. Like we're not there yet. So yeah, that's okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll figure it out. Um, the other thing I want that I know is going to make it more difficult, but I hope it's okay. Um, <laughs> Why do you look at me? Well, because you're the one that's going to have to figure out some of this stuff. Oh, okay. Um, like I'm listening. The the trimotor had, you know, the external wires that actually oh, yeah. controlled the surfaces. The control cables, yeah. I want those to actually work and control the surfaces. Okay. Like oh, I'll, I think I'll give you ailerons. That probably is gonna be difficult because we're gonna have to make a, a removable wing. Um mm-hmm. but I want it to look like we're actually controlling the surfaces with the pull pull cables or whatever the, yeah, the cable I, setup is. I actually uh I, I think that's that's gonna be doable. Honestly. Good. Yeah, That's I what think, I wanted uh, to hear. It's yeah. going to be doable because you're going to figure it out. <laughs> we will get it figured out. No, but I think, um, I mean, if yeah, I, I think there will be ways to make that uh, make that work the way you want it to and make it look good uh, and still kind of stay within the scale-ish boundaries <laughs> of the of the project. So, yeah, I look forward to that kind of a challenge. I, it's that, That'll be a fun aspect of the build, I think. Yeah, we'll have to take some liberties with it, I think. To kind of make it fit what we need to do. I mean, we're not going to like enter competitions or anything with this. It's just a neat build that uh, that we're going to do together. And I am super excited and, about. Uh, it. Yeah. And uh, and we'll make it look as good as uh, as good as we can for our limited uh, <laughs> skills that we have. <laughs> hey, it's it's better than not having one, right? That's, I agree. So, and I don't know of very many ten foot wingspan trimotors out there. It's hard to find a trimotor. Yeah. I mean, that's, I, I love is, the actually. airplanes and it's, you just don't see them very often. Nope. So you got to build one. So I'm glad we found plans that are going to be suitable for us we, to work with. What are we going to do for a pilot? I just I thought know. of that. We're going to have to come up with a pilot and a co-pilot. We are. It should be us. And may, <laughs> maybe some pa- <laughs> 3D print our heads on a... I don't know how to do that, oh but we gosh. might have to figure that out. Yeah, you're going to have to figure that out. And then we'll have to have it to where our, our, our heads turn when the rudder turns well, again. Of course. I mean, that's easy. Of course. Well, yeah, you've already oh, done that. So. so much to figure out, but I'm excited. <laughs> um, I was thinking for the ailerons, though, because, you know, I want the pull-pull cables. Yes. I think I would like to see about maybe putting a servo in the wing itself, mm-hmm. like by each aileron, yep. and, and setting that up on a, a pull-pull system. Yep. Easy peasy. That's it. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Then that's what we're going to do on that. Oh, yeah. See, yeah, that's not can... as bad. That was the one that actually really concerned me because I wanted to do the actual cables to the ailerons. Mm-hmm. But if we don't need to go to the actual ailerons, then that'll work just fine. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll. I mean, I can envision embedding a servo into the into that rib bay where you want the wires to come out. 
Um, and then, yeah, just hooking up a pull pull with a dual sided control horn. Easy peasy. Nice. Yeah. And maybe even 3D print the control horn. How cool. Can that we be? be finished yet? Like, I want to see this thing fly. Like, I, for, I, okay. So I think of like shots that we can get. And the shot okay. that I am most excited about is putting a camera inside the cabin. Yep. Seeing out the window, mm-hmm. like, so it looks like it's sitting in a seat, yeah. seeing out the window while we're flying it, while seeing the interior view too. Oh, like, that would be cool. I don't know why. That's the one I'm like super excited yeah. to see actually come to fruition. I think we can make that happen. Let's let's get it going. All Come right. on, I'm ready. Yeah. Well, you step you, at a time. You mentioned that we were kind of limited on the engines that we're planning on using. Right. Um, and that's all on you. You wanted to stick to four strokes for obvious reasons because they're awesome and they sound a little bit more scale than a gasoline two stroke or a nitro two stroke or heaven forbid electric. Electric, I think, would have been problematic in this size. Don't you think? Well, not necessarily. It could have been done. Well, expensive though. I mean, electric motors in this size in that one twenty ish size range can be kind of pricey, right? The price would have gone up, but I don't think it would. I mean, it definitely would have been easier. Okay, like well, the simplicity of setting it up would be a lot well, yeah. easier than, uh, yeah, than what you you're that. doing. I'll give you that. But the, um, but the cost and 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 if we went electric, then that would all fall kind of on you. I think the cost would have actually been cheaper to stick with electric. Yeah, but it wouldn't have sounded as good. Which is why I'm not fighting you on that. <laughs> and this can be your airplane because I don't want to buy nitro anymore. <laughs> oh, so I get to feed it then. Okay. Um, $7 for a three-minute flight. <laughs> yeah. Probably it's be worth, worth it. it. Yeah. Um, Just to hear it. So I already have um, – already had a couple of engine choices uh, that we could we could go with. I have uh, an OS-91 uh, four-stroke. Uh, three of those bad boys would fly – you know, a 25 to 30 pound airplane with power to spare, which is something that's important. We need power to spare. Yep. Um, I also had a, a Sato 82 on hand, which, you know, um, not quite the power of an OS 91, um, but it's lighter. It's lighter than an OS 91. So the power to weight ratio uh, and the ability to swing a big prop uh, was kind of important. Also, we, we don't want to have this huge airplane with tiny little 10 inch props on it. So, um and then I have a Thunder Tiger 91 four stroke also, which kind of is out of the out of the running because it's heavy. It's a heavy engine and it doesn't produce as much power as the OS. Oh, I didn't realize that was a four stroke. I thought yeah. that was a two stroke. No, no, no. No, I didn't even consider two strokes because uh, we wanted that nice four stroke sound. Um, I agree. So yeah, I'm looking, uh, I've got one OS 91. I'm going to be in the market for two more. Um, and I did place an ad on RC groups uh, for some used equipment, which is uh, the point we're going to talk about here in a little bit, buying used equipment. Um, but uh, I did run some numbers, and the OS, uh, I think, is probably our best option for power to weight. It's going to swing a big prop. Uh, it's going to produce about 11 pounds plus um, of thrust each. So if we can get this thing built in under 30 pounds, these OS 91s are going to be our, uh, I think, going to be our best bet. Yeah, that'll give us a one-to-one weight ratio. And I already own one, so there we go. We're so gonna, we only need two more. We've got a head start on that. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ran it? Uh, it's been a while, but it has been ran. Yep. Okay. Yep, and it runs good. So. I'd like to see that on the test stand, actually. Okay, I might be able to make that happen. Yeah, cool. Maybe we'll make a short video of that, too. Yeah. I don't know if anybody, if you guys like uh, watching engine run videos, let us know. I'll be happy to put some together because I like them, too. <laughs> <laughs> You've got like 74 engines you got to try uh, and get ran. I've got a few. Way um, too many, but, but that's uh, okay. So how are we going to cover this thing? That I haven't thought that far ahead on yet, but I want... We've like, given it some thought, but we but not a finalized haven't thought. really... Yeah, so the Ford Trimotor, the original Ford Trimotor was covered in a corrugated... corrugated aluminum. Um, I think it was aluminum. I th- I'm sure I'm it sure was. it was probably... It was actually... Its nickname was the Tin, tin Goose. Lizzie. Or the was Tin Lizzie. Tin Lizzie. I've seen both. Uh, or the Tin Goose, Sure. I've seen them both. That's true. What's that one say? Um, so Tin Goose. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> it says it right on the plans, folks. Uh-huh. Uh huh. So anyway, um, we're gonna we're gonna try to replicate that corrugated finish somehow. Yeah, we'll have to figure that out. Yeah, that's gonna be a, a lot of a lot of trial and error. I think we're probably gonna build a couple wings. Um, and <laughs> build a couple wings and try and see what we can get them to do and, and yeah. trash a couple wings. Well, uh, but I, I'm okay with that. Like, 
Yeah. It, I always build extra wings, apparently. So. Well, you build three for the du- for your duelist. Three so, wings I mean, for the duelist. So hopefully if we do it doesn't th- take three to do this project. If we do three for this one, then um, we do three. But like I can I can kind of envision seeing um like a vacuum formed ABS uh sheet uh that we yeah. can then apply to the like maybe the bare airframe if if we can get away with that without incorporating twist into the wing. Um, that's kind of the, the, the direction I kind of see us going. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we may have to, we may have to experiment with some other projects, but it, I mean, it's got to <laughs> have that corrugated finish. So I have to build <laughs> a vacuum form machine now. Yes. That's okay. Yes. It's okay. I mean, we need one. You'll be able to use that for other projects too. Oh, absolutely. Like I'm not shying away Cowls, from it. canopies, wheel pants. I mean, all kinds of windows. We're going to need cabin windows for this thing. So they're all flat in this one. Well, <laughs> true. How are you going to mount them flush, though? What do you mean? We'll just if they're we can route off the inside. Oh, I see. Of the you're balsa. Saying. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's we a lot that easier. Too. That's true. We'll figure it out, though. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, we're gonna have to try to simulate the the corrugated finish of the full size one. I think because that's a really a uh, a distinguishing feature. Yeah. Of well, that and airplane. I want it to be silver. I mean, I want it to have that silver look to it, yep. and you can't get that with uh, the regular, you know, like monocoat or or the other stuff that we've no, used. No, I mean, you could simulate it a few different ways uh, with, with uh, you know, tape and paint and building up layers of paint and then peeling the tape off, and but it's just not the same as a real corrugated, you know, finish, so. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, so I think, uh, I think it's going to be a fun project. Yeah, I'm very excited. Actually, I'm I'm ready to get started. I wish I had everything else finished that I have to do first. <laughs> I, yeah, me too. And like, I wasn't all that excited about this. Like, I I was, but it didn't actually like start to hit me until you sent me the plans. And then you and printed I printed them, them <laughs> and I saw them, and I saw my new wallpaper. Yeah, <laughs> and I just fell in love with it. Like, I mean, it's, seriously, this is cool. I'm I am excited also, and it's not even it's not even for me, and I'm excited. Well, about it is it, so. kind of for you. I mean. Well, You're no, gonna come be on, let's be I don't honest. think I'll fly this one. What? what? I don't know. That's a lot of pressure on me. Oh, heavens. <laughs> it's going to be fine. It will be. We got to build it light. We do. Uh, like your duelist. Unlike which, your duelist. You, right. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's going to be a fun project and I'm looking forward to getting started. Well, I guess we've already started. So I'm looking forward to making progress. I'm looking forward to cutting our first part. Yeah. You're going to do that just because, aren't you? I can't. Like, literally, this is too big. Well, there's some parts you could probably cut on the laser cutter. That could be. <laughs> but definitely, like, the main the main spot. Nope. The main ribs. <laughs> One of these days. The main ribs are too big to go on a laser cutter. So I've got yeah. to make it bigger. Yeah. And it'll be okay. We'll get it. Yep. We'll get there. Soon. Cool. So what else do you want to talk about? So I thought I'd build on last week's episode. Uh, we, we talked about um, things you can do to save money. Uh, in the hobby. Um, and I, I wanted to touch on this last week, but we kind of ran long. So I'm going to go ahead and finish it off. Really long. Yeah, we did. And that's my fault. Cause I, I like to talk about, well, RC airplanes and stuff. <laughs> You're in the right place. So, um, so I thought we would finish, kind of finish that whole saving money in the hobby off by talking about, um, buying used RC equipment. Have a lot of experience with that. <laughs> and that makes sense since you just put your ad up on RC groups and you're trying to buy used motors. Exactly. So, yep. yeah. Um, so, which by the way, if anybody wants a kit, <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Yeah. Look on RC groups. Tom has <laughs> what, four or five of them on there. So, yeah, I've got, uh, I've got eight airplanes, uh, old airplane kits that I'll be honest, I'm probably never going to get, or I'm not going to get around to building anytime soon. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, so they are available for trade. So if you have an OS 91 FS, uh, not the FS2, uh, the FS, that's the, the silver rocker cover, not the black one. Um, yeah, hit me up if you're interested in any of those kits, or even if you want to, you know, uh, do some trading for other stuff, who knows, I might have something you're interested in. What's the matter with the F- FS2? Because that's not, the, not what I already have. Oh, okay. I want them to match. Oh, so it's got to be that engine. Yeah, which they made for many, many years, and there's a lot of them out there. Okay. So, um, but I, yeah, thanks uh, for, for the plug on, on my ad. But uh, yeah, we're talking about buying used RC equipment, and uh, there's lots of places you can go to do that. Um, eBay, uh, RC Groups, RC Universe, uh, Flying Giants. There's there's quite a few, actually, um, forums out there online. Um, and 
hopefully soon we'll get back to normal with uh with without covid and you can go to swap meets and things like that swap meets are my favorite thing like <laughs> you can find so many good deals and so many different airplanes that you don't see anywhere else it's true and like, and swap meets are awesome yeah and they and what i like about swap meets is is you handle the transaction right there in person you can you can feel it you can smell it you can you can you can move <laughs> yes, it you, can. You, know, you, know, you can test it yeah. things like that um which that's and, and I really like the swap meets too. I, I like going to them. Sometimes I just like going to them just to see what's out there with no intention of buying anything, even though I always end always up come home with something. something. Yeah. Okay. So until swap meets start, yeah. How else can we buy stuff? So, like I mentioned, there's online forums. Um, I'm a big fan of RC groups and RC Universe. Um, I also buy stuff on eBay. And there's certain things uh, when you're when you're buying. Um, that you can do to protect yourself. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but those are some of the places you can go right now uh, to buy used equipment. And also, um, if you're a member of the club, usually your club has meetings uh, periodically, either once a month or maybe once every couple of months or something like that in the slow season. Um, sometimes talking to club members is a good way to kind of put feelers out. And if you're looking for something specifically, uh, more eyes are always better uh, when you're looking for something like in my case, we're looking for, you know, OS 91 four strokes. So keep you know. saying it, maybe somebody's going to have one. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, so the more people that you have looking, the better. So, uh, your club meetings and things like that, when you're interacting with your club members, uh, that's a good way to get stuff too. Uh, yeah. especially if you're looking for something specifically. Well, and if you have hobby shops too, a lot of times they use some or they yep. sell some used stuff. Yeah. Um, yep. so it's good to know what you're looking at. Yeah. It's not, it's not at all uncommon to, to find a, a used like section, if you will, at, uh, at most any hobby shop. In fact, our favorite hobby shop, um, has a huge, uh, a huge, uh, selection of, of used equipment. And, hundreds and hundreds of airplanes. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. And we've bought quite a bit of used stuff from him yeah. uh, at the hobby shop, which again, uh, nice. Haven't, haven't been bitten yet. No, not yet. Um, very happy with everything that I've purchased from Brian so far. So, but it also has to do with the fact that we know what we're looking at. Exactly. You I can, mean, you can you can feel it. You can maybe see it in operation. You can, right. If it's an engine, you can turn it over and things like that. And listen. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, those are those are some of the ways and some of the places you can go to find um, used equipment. So, how do you do it safely? It's a very good question. PayPal is going to be one of the more common ways that people want money. So the one thing that I would suggest with PayPal, um, PayPal is awesome. That's how we all send money for a lot of things. Yeah, They have friends and family. Um, the nice thing about friends and family is you use it for friends and family only. Right. Because there's no legal recourse. Yeah. You know, there's there's no way to get your money back right. if the, the seller doesn't do what they're supposed to do. Right. There's no, there's no protection. Right. But there's also no extra fees. Right. So... <clears throat> What I've done before is if somebody is wanting to sell something and they want friends and family, uh, I will offer to pay the extra 3% because that's what the fees are for doing the the normal PayPal. Mm -hmm. um, offer to do that. That way you have some recourse for, you know, if they don't send it, if it gets lost, if they if they don't hold up their end of the bargain. Yeah. Um, and then you can go through PayPal with that. Right. If they will not do that, some people won't do it and they will only do friends and family. They're the ones that kind of scare me. And I understand because a lot of times people will also, you know, if you're if you're selling something and you can get the money for it, you can ship it out, and the person that bought it off of you can say they didn't get it even if they did. So I understand people not wanting to do it other than friends and family. Um, but there's just you, – you have to kind of know who you're dealing with, which yeah. sometimes is hard to do if it's online. Right. So if they won't do friends and family, I won't buy it from them. Yeah. That's just me. Yeah, and, and I, it's, I think it's called goods and services – I think yeah. you, I think you get two options uh, when you when you pay with uh, PayPal, and I'm the same way. I, I prefer not to use uh, friends and family unless unless it's somebody that I already have established a rapport with, right? Um, which, uh, um, good or bad, I already have a a group of people that I kind of have a rapport with on RC groups and eBay and things like that. So um, if it's somebody I already trust, then yeah, I have no problem with the uh, friends and family just to save on the fees. But if it's somebody that I'm unfamiliar with, or maybe they have a trader rating, which I'll talk about that in a second, um, that, that isn't really high or, or they don't have, you know, good reviews on their, on their transactions, um, then I will, I will always insist on goods and services and I'll, 
I'll pay the extra three percent just for that peace of mind, yeah. knowing that PayPal is gonna is gonna cover me if if things go awry. Now, having said that, I've never had I've never had to to use PayPal's um, uh, restoration services resolution resolution thank you yeah. that's it uh restoration yeah that, yeah i don't know your car got wet or something yeah, i guess um <laughs> but yeah luckily i've i've never had to use use that um, i've always uh, i've always had um a pretty good experience with uh rc groups ebay uh, rc universe all the places i i trade and sell online um but i will always use that uh, goods and services and pay that three percent fee for a transaction that may or may not be you know as comfortable as somebody that i'm used to dealing with yeah um and i mentioned trader ratings yeah i've never heard of that before because i've so, never done anything on yeah. rc groups so rc groups um and um, rc universe and even ebay i think it's called something else with ebay i think they're called their eBay seller. has seller ratings and feedback That's it. and that kind of stuff yep, their yeah. feedback rating um it's something that uh like uh, when you when you have a transaction with somebody, and I'll use RC Groups uh, as my most recent example, um, I bought an engine uh, from uh, a fellow modeler on you RC Groups. You bought an engine? I can't imagine. <laughs> I've bought several <laughs> lately, but anyway. Um, <clears throat> so when I received the engine and I looked it over and it was uh, it was as the seller described, um, I went back to the uh, to the page where I offered to buy the engine. And there's a link there that you can click to submit a trader rating. And uh, the more positive of those that trader gets, the more comfortable people are going to be to trade with him or buy from him or, or what have you. Um, so that, that trader rating is a really, really good tool you can use to um, sort of give you a, a, um, a warm fuzzy about that particular <laughs> transaction. Yeah. Uh, so, um, you know, if they've if they if it's a member that uh, just joined yesterday and he has a trader rating of zero, and the price of his item seems like it's too good to be true, it probably, probably is. is. I mean, use use some good common sense when you're when you're shopping online, um, and uh, usually, um, for the most part, people want to do the right thing. So uh, for the most part, if you're if you just use a little common sense, look at those trader ratings and use those goods and services if you're paying with PayPal anyway online, um, and you'll you'll I think you'll be okay. Um, some things to look for if you can if you can do your transaction in person, um, we'll talk about those next. Well, I think next is now. Well, how about we talk about radios first? Okay. So um, I'm not a huge fan of buying radios used radios um, online because you can't turn it on. You can't verify that it's, that it's operational. You can't move the servos around with the sticks and things like that. So um, it has to be either a really good deal from a really trusted source um, uh, with really good terms for me to buy a radio, a used radio or radio equipment for that matter um, online. Um, if you can do it in person, like, our friend Brian at the hobby shop or a swap meet or, you know, friends at the club. Um, obviously if, uh, if they're uncomfortable turning the radio on in front of you, you probably don't want to buy that radio. Yeah. But if they can demonstrate that it works, then so much the better that will make you feel better about that, uh, about that purchase. Yeah. If they tell you the battery is dead, go get batteries <laughs> Yeah. or go get a charger, a charger. or whatever it takes. Cause yeah. yeah, if you're, if you're buying something in person, you're very much better off to actually see it working. Yeah, and in my experience, five minutes uh, on a wall charger that comes with uh, with most radios is enough to to test the radio Just adequately. Just enough to turn it on. That's all you got to do. Yep. Right. Yep. So um, that's a couple of tips. Uh, see it in operation. Um, if you're going to a swap meet, this is a little trick I like to do. Uh, and now I'll preface this by saying usually if I'm going to buy used radio equipment, it's going to be spectrum equipment. Yeah. Um, so I'll take a, a spare spectrum receiver with me and maybe a four cell like, you know, nickel metal hydride pack so I can plug the receiver in and try to bind that radio to the receiver and see if it'll bind. Yeah, like a receiver pack. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, one one little thing you can do to kind of protect yourself from, from a, a bogus uh, transaction. That's if you're buying it, you know, in person. Obviously yeah. hard to do that online, but... 
That's a good idea. And that's why swap meets are so nice because you actually get to see and feel and touch and play with the things you want to buy. Exactly. Um, what about engines? Like engines, I would not necessarily buy used. Uh, oh, first buy off, <laughs> because I don't really need a lot of nitro engines. Well, that's true. But I don't really know what I'm looking for. Like electric is easy. If you spin it and you really don't feel any kind of resistance or if it's not gritty mm -hmm. or if you don't hear any, you know, like sandy stuff inside of it. Mm hmm most you know most likely it's going to be fine yeah or it doesn't smell burnt yeah it doesn't smell burnt that's another and good you laughed one, but... when i said smell earlier but that is a <laughs> i mean you can learn a lot from especially a you nitro can. engine by smelling it really? i know it sounds crazy but but it, you can, it does sound like, crazy you know if you've been doing it for you know a while nitro i'm talking about you can you can actually tell a lot by smelling a used engine so I'll talk about that. So I don't know if I ever want to go with you to another swap meet and just have you like sit there and smell all these motors you're trying to buy. That's just kind of weird. <laughs> it is weird. Um, I have to admit, and it looks funny it to see somebody sniffing a sniffing a nitro motor. But um, what I'm <laughs> what I'm sniffing for, um, caster has a certain odor um, when it's been really, really, really hot. Okay, um, and the same thing goes for synthetic. Um, oils that are in our fuels. Uh, so if if I'm turning an engine over and I'm sniffing the exhaust, um, I'm I'm trying to ascertain whether that engine has been hot or not. And you can tell usually if because most folks let's let's be honest, most folks who are going to sell a used nitro motor, they're going to pull it off their airplane. Maybe they'll put it in a Ziploc bag, maybe, and they'll take it to the swap meet. Yeah. Uh, they're not going to do a lot of cleaning and things like that, more than likely. So um, a lot of the times, if that engine has been hot, it will still smell like it has been ran hot. Um, so uh, other things you want to look for? Well, hold on. So if it's ran hot, mm -hmm. what does that matter? Okay. And Hold on. Sorry. No more question. Okay. If it's been ran hot, what does that matter? And can you tell in compression that it's been, like, if it, is it going to lose compression if it overheats? Usually, yes. Okay. Uh, so if an engine has been ran hot maybe once on accident really, really briefly, probably going to be okay. And it's probably going to run after that, so that smell will kind of dissipate. If an engine has been ran hot, like consistently and often, um, it's going to, more than likely, it's going to have, if it's an ABC engine, it's going to have significantly lower compression. Um, and if it's a ringed engine, it's probably going to have lower compression. Um, but with ringed engines, you have to be careful that sometimes when they're cold, they can also have lower compression than when they're warmed up because of expansion of metal parts and things like that, yeah. creating a seal. Um, so the smell <laughs> combined with the, with the, uh, lack or, um, presence of compression will give you a good indication of, of kind of the engine's overall health. Now that's a two stroke. A four stroke is a little different animal, a little bit harder to tell um, because four strokes, you know, if, if, if it's low in compression, it doesn't necessarily mean that the sleeve is worn, you know, from the piston. It could be a bad sealing valve, mm -hmm. which could be as simple as something as carbon buildup. So with a four stroke- Or out of adjustment even. It, exactly. Could be out of adjustment. Maybe the valves are too tight. Um, so a four stroke, it's a little bit more involved to get a really good read on the compression. Um, if the seller doesn't mind you dismantling his engine, um, you can pull a valve cover off and you can kind of check the, um, the lash of the valves. And if they're too tight, maybe he'll let you back off the valves to see if that valve will, will indeed seat and restore compression. Um, sometimes you can also throw a little bit of oil on top of the, uh, intake valve and then draw it through compression, pull that oil into the cylinder. And then if that bumps up the compression, then usually that's an indication of probably the valve is not fully seated. So there's some carbon buildup or it could be a bent valve. If it's a bent valve, um, you'll feel that when you're pulling the engine over, you'll feel that resistance when it, when it's trying to actuate that valve. So there's a lot of things you can tell when you're, when you're buying a used engine in person, just by sniffing it, <laughs> uh, and, and rolling it over through compression. Um, <laughs> and you can also test for bearings too. You, you'll feel, um, a bad bearing. Kind of that same also. grittiness that you get with electric. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So those are some things to look for, uh, with, uh, when buying a used, uh, nitro engine. Gassers are a little bit more difficult to, uh, to determine the health um, because, you know, the electronic ignition, um, they, generally speaking, don't 
quite make as much compression as a, a similar sized uh, two stroke or nitro motor. Um, so they're a little bit harder to tell. Um, but something I would look for on a gas engine is the condition of the carburetor. Like if it's, if it's clean and it smells like fresh fuel, probably has been ran recently and probably runs fine. Um, but unfortunately, the only way to test, you know, um, a gasser with, you know, electronic ignition is to run it, unfortunately. And you're probably not going to do that at a swap meet. Probably not. Yeah. But sometimes, though, there's really not a lot that can go wrong with those. So True. if yeah, it very looks simple. like it's okay, yeah. if it's in good shape, you know, a rebuild for the carburetor is cheap. Very inexpensive. Ignitions yep. can get a little bit more expensive if that's a problem, but it's not the end of the world either. Yeah. And so. they do go bad, as we <clears throat> as we evidenced on the trash can <laughs> Telemaster project. Uh -huh. um, but I bought a, a quality ignition, a CH ignition. Uh, replacement for that. And I think it was only, what did I say? It was 75 70 bucks, bucks I, I thought, something in there, yeah. So, I mean, and hopefully, knock on wood, um, it'll run like a top the next time we, we go to fly it. Which will be in the spring. <laughs> yeah, it's too It's got to be in the spring. We got to yeah. get that done. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, Ooh. so what if you're going to buy an airplane? What do you look for like a full-on airplane? Yeah, so um, that's like the most exciting Exciting part of going to a swap meet, I yeah, think, is uh, I do too. is buying a full airplane, a, a, a ready to fly, ready to go, already finished airplane, um, because because you can usually get them cheap. That and you don't have to build it, yeah, I <laughs> which I mean I enjoy, but sometimes you just want an airplane and you know ready to go and to go fly. I bought several like balsa airplanes, ready to go, electric, of course, of course, for fifty to sixty bucks a piece. At the swap meets, yeah. At the they, swap meets, yeah. They're all, they, they always, I'm not sure why that is, but they're always ridiculously cheap. Yeah. Like the Super Sportster that I bought, I think that was 60 And it flies awesome. It did fly awesome. I crashed that well, one, and that, I had to buy another one because I liked it so much. Yeah. Um, and I crashed that one in the trees. Like, <laughs> it was just an accident to where it, it, I didn't land in time, and where I was flying was a little bit more difficult to fly, and I had to get it down. Literally, I probably had 40 feet to where it had to touch down. If it was too early, I would have ran into trees. Yeah. If it was too late, I would run into trees. Trees. Yeah. And that's what I did. I, I overshot my runway and ran into trees, and it just completely broke the the wing off. Mm. But I replaced it, mm -hmm. and I paid more, unfortunately, for the <laughs> for, for the, the new ARF to put all the stuff in <laughs> than I did for the whole thing beforehand. So. Yeah, but it's <clears throat> good flying airplane and yeah, was a lot of fun. It. I enjoyed it. Still do. So generally speaking, I won't buy whole airplanes online. Just because it's ridiculous to ship a big airplane. Um, yeah. I know there's options, you know, people use Greyhound or, you know, if it's a really big airplane, they'll build a crate and all that. I, I myself, I prefer to avoid all of that. Um, sometimes you can find, like on in RC groups, for example, you can find sellers who are selling their stuff that aren't real far away. So maybe you can make a road trip to pick yeah. something like that up. And, a day trip is kind of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but generally speaking, um, I stick to just going to the swap meets or, or ball, uh, dynamic balsa uh, to get my to get my full airplane uh, used airplane fix. Um, <laughs> but some things to look for. Um, I mean, you could answer this as easily as I could. It's you know, it's almost like putting your airplane away in the in the fall. You'd, you'd kind of look for the same things. Right? Oh yeah, you go over things. You make sure the the structure is okay. Mm -hmm. um, you want to look at like your the internal structure of it to make sure everything is is good. There's mm -hmm. no cracks. Yeah, uh, you don't want to see any broken balsa, or anything like that. If there is, like that's not even the end of the world. No, no. If stuff it's is an easy, easy fix. fix, yeah. If it's an easy fix, you can talk them down on price even more. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, like. I know you need to check like motor mounts and all that stuff to make sure that they're still intact. Mm -hmm. um, and once again, if they're not, not the end of the world, but that kind of concerns me more than something on the side. Yeah. Like hanger rash is not that big of a deal. Somebody grabbed it too tight and broke a piece of balsa. It happens. Easy fix. Yep. Um, motor mounts and stuff being broken are usually a sign of something else has happened to it. Yeah. Um, like maybe a rough landing. Or a rough landing, ran into something, dropped a little harder than yeah. I would be yeah. comfortable with. Um, I always look at the landing gear blocks too. Yeah. That's a that's a common item for to be, especially on some of these lightweight ARFs that we fly, uh, the landing gear blocks get torn out pretty easily, it seems like. so. And the hard landings are common with a lot of yeah. things. So. And, and even if I see a, a torn out or a repaired landing gear block, that's... Again, not the end of the world. No, it's not. But um, you need to know what you're getting into. Yeah, just 
you know, verify that it's a good repair. And, mm-hmm. uh, and if it needs more repair, then, you know, there you go. Talk them down more, on it even more. <laughs> yeah, more material on uh, talking them down on the price. Yeah, and just make sure it comes with everything it's supposed to come with. Oh, my um, gosh. I got a story. I've got okay. a story for you. So this has been a while ago. Uh-huh. Um, this may have actually been before before you started flying, maybe. It's okay. been a long time ago. Anyway, I uh, went to a swap meet. Uh, it was a it was a swap meet down in the Belleville area, which is not too far from where we live here. I've been to that one. It's yeah. a good swap meet. Yeah, you may have. It may have. Well, anyway, let me tell my story and you can tell me if it If, if it, it rings, rings a bell. bell. So uh, I went with several people people um <laughs> might have been me <laughs> yeah I, i've been to this swap meet quite a few times actually so i'm not sure and i always i've never gone there alone like i always seem to go with people because it's fun and you know uh, yeah anyway uh one of the individuals that was with me um bought an airplane go figure yeah it's a swap meet got a good deal on it um was excited about it you know, we paid a good price for it and, uh, and, you know, bought it fairly early. Like, you know, we walked in and it was like one of the first things he saw and the first things he purchased. So he bought it, bundled it all up and took it out to the car and uh-huh. then, and then came back into the swap meet to do some more shopping. Um, got home, he unloaded it. And about a week later, uh, I believe I got a phone call from this individual who said, you're never going to guess what I did. And of course, I'm like, I, what are you talking about? He said, you remember the swap meet we went to? Remember that airplane I bought? I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm tracking. He's like, um, did you pick up the wing tube for the wings? <laughs> and, I, and I'm and i like, well, no. Why would I pick up the wing tube? You bought the airplane. Uh, so if you go to a swap meet and you buy an airplane, make sure you have the wing tube. Yeah. Because... Everything needs to be with the airplane. He had to, yeah. He then had to find some place to find a wing tube, and it, I'm sure it was an airplane that was wasn't made anymore. So, you know, just one of those inconveniences that a great deal became an okay deal. You know, yeah, because I mean? wing tubes are it's harder to find the exact size you need, so you want to make sure that you get that when you buy the plane. Yeah, and there's metric, and then there's standard. standard and, there's carbon fiber. Yeah. There's aluminum. So fiberglass. Yeah. Cardboard. <laughs> I've seen. Yeah. I, so. Yeah, if you if you buy an airplane at a swap meet, make sure you get the wing tubes if applicable. Yeah, all the hardware <laughs> needs to be there. So, so Who that's was some, it, by the way. I can't remember. I think I think that may have been Reggie. Reggie, if you're if you're listening or watching, um, let me know if I'm if I'm remembering that correctly. If it wasn't Reggie, then it may have been another trip. But yeah, somebody bought an airplane, forgot the wing tube. <laughs> it wasn't me, so that's all that matters. And it wasn't me because I, I don't think I've ever bought a a full airplane at that swap meet. Anyway, so, all, all right. right. So, should we move on to listener questions? We so got yeah, a few we've, of got those a, to, we've got a few listener do. questions. Hopefully, uh, to to kind of wrap that up. Hopefully, we we've, we've been able to save some folks some money, um, and don't be afraid to buy used equipment unless it's radio equipment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I said, I love used. Yeah. I like the deals you can get. Uh, so anyway, right. let's move on to listener questions. You okay. ready? Yep, I'm ready. Fred says, "Hello. Wonder if you did a podcast about battery chargers yet." Any suggestions on one for LiPos or NIMH? Uh, I have an old AccuCycle Elite from Habaco, mm-hmm. but it's not really safe for LiPos, uh, from what I read, being there's no balancing port. Getting back into the hobby, like I emailed you before, and it's very confusing about chargers being so many different ones out there on yeah. the market. Yeah. Hope to hear your suggestions if you have any. So what do you say for chargers, Tom? Well, I, I could not agree with Fred more that there is there is an overwhelming um, array of different chargers out there. Um, so generally speaking, I would stick to a charger that is AC DC, mm-hmm. one that you can plug into the wall or you can or your car or your car on a twelve volt battery. Yep. Um, and also, you're going to look for something that is that is a multi chemistry, and and what I mean by that is is a charger that will charge that has the right programming um, already installed into the charger to charge all the different types of batteries, nickel metal hydride, um, nickel cadmium, uh, lithium polymer, lithium ion, the lithium iron, the LIFE batteries. Um, most ACDC chargers that are sold today, um, and I'm, I'm going to just throw a number out there, like 75% of the ones that I saw when I did my research on, on, uh, 
on our saving money episode uh, on Amazon, all of those, 75% at least of the charges that I, that I type, you know, when I typed in RC battery charger uh, in the search block, they were all that type of charger, ACDC, multi-chemistry. Um, myself, I'm a huge fan of the high-tech chargers. Uh, which are a brand name, so they're a little bit more expensive, um, but they make one. I forget the the name of it, but uh, I use a a a four port, a high tech four port charger. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can get that same uh, you can get that charger with the same features in a single port for much less money. Yeah, and I want to say that charger is about fifty nine bucks. Yeah, chargers are not all that expensive. Yeah. Like um, name brand versus cheap ones, there's really not much of a difference. Right, right. Um, and like I said, I'm a huge fan of, of the high-tech charger. Thunder Power makes a good charger too. They're a little bit more money. Um, but bottom line, just just look for a charger that is convenient to use um, and something that does the multi-chemistry. And, and what you're looking for is the, the programming, the charge profiles are specific to each type of battery. And it'll say that on the on the menu too. It'll Absolutely. it'll say as you're going through the menu what it will charge. Yep. And really, as long as it has the lipo balance charge thing on it, you're good. Yep. And exactly. when you're charging, charge at one capacity. So if it's a five thousand milliamp battery, charge at five amps. If it's a thirteen hundred milliamp battery, charge at one point three amps. Yep. That's the easiest yep. way to do it. So. Yep. Exactly. Um, next, you ready? Yeah. So Ron asks. Um, not me, by the way. Uh, yeah, this was another Ron. Different Ron. Uh, he asked. The, he says, uh, "C Spectrum has come out with a four and six channel sport receivers that are lower cost, but still more expensive than the orange receivers." Uh, he asks, "Are orange receivers a reliable option?" Well, we've touched on that before, and that is such a loaded question. It is, and I'm going to say, depends on your airplane. I mean, that's that's the, fair. the long short of it. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I like orange receivers. Um, except they're getting expensive. They are like they they've gone they're up more quite a bit than they were. Yeah. yeah, they've they've gone up quite a bit to where it's not as great of a deal. To where I'm not all that concerned about spending the extra money on something that's actually like Spectrum. Right. Um, the six channel receiver I just bought for the the Duelist was thirty nine bucks, forty bucks. Um, <laughs> so when I what are you cold? I've just it it slays me that that you're you're. Cheapening out? Is yeah, that what you're saying? On, on a project that you put so much care and effort into. Oh, well. But it'll it'll work or it won't work. I, I agree. And so far it's worked. So far um, for the three flights, it's worked. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's a, it's a crapshoot all the time. Yeah. Now so. I will answer the question. I will say um, kind of the same as what, uh, what Ron here is saying. Um, you know, what, what is the airplane worth to you? I, I'll go further and I'll say, how much do you like that airplane? Um, is it, is it worth getting upset if it crashes because you cheaped out on the receiver? Yeah. Especially now that, that, that the prices are, are so much more closer well, that than was, they used to be. That was the point I was trying to make. When I bought my orange receivers years ago, they were five ninety nine and six nine or six ninety nine a piece. Oh I think gosh. the four channel was five ninety nine and the six channel was six ninety nine. So under seven bucks. I'm cool with that. And I think they're up to like twenty, twenty five dollars now. Would you put an orange receiver in the tri motor project? No. <laughs> okay. But I don't necessarily know if I'm comfortable doing, you know, I don't know what I'd be comfortable doing in there. That's probably going to have to be like a, I don't know what, a 10 channel spectrum receiver with satellites. Oh, I mean, yeah. we're going to need absolutely. a real good setup yeah. in that one. And we're um, going to need the channels for it too, by the way. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of extra stuff. That a lot we're of extra stuff. Doing. So Ron, not you, Ron, but Ron, Another our Ron. listener. Um, cool, Ron. It's up to you. I mean, we've already kind of uh, sent you an email back. Hopefully you've read that. But uh, uh, my my take on it is, uh, is how much do you like that airplane? If it's an airplane that you really like, um, it's probably worth spending a few extra dollars to get what I would consider a quality uh, product. Having said that, I don't want to beat a dead horse. <laughs> but the only issue I've ever had with a receiver has been Spectrum. Yeah. So for what it's worth. I've yep. I've flown orange stuff and had no problems with it. Yeah, yeah, I understand. This actually, if you're watching on YouTube, this little airplane in front of me has an orange receiver in it. Yes, it does. So be it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, Noah contacted us um, through email, I believe it was, 
Oh, actually, you've contacted us with uh, the uh, listener survey, and then he he followed up with an email. Yeah. Um, Which reminds me, do a listener survey. If yeah. you haven't filled one out, fill one out and let us know what you're thinking. Yep. Uh, right there, right there on our uh, rcplanelab.com, right on the homepage, there's listener, listener survey surveys. link. Uh, yep. Yeah, do that. And um, once again, not to beat a dead horse, to use your uh, phrase. I think I said it right, right? You did. Okay, good. Um, but uh, yeah, those listener surveys help us uh, by helping you. Uh, gives us ideas to talk about. So hopefully we're not boring you to tears. Hopefully you hear stuff that you want to hear and not and just let, what we want to talk about. And lets us know the negative feedback for doing things wrong exactly. or you know any feedback is good. So if there's That's things right. you don't like, let us know. Yep. Yep. Make it constructive if you can. But we'll, <laughs> Tom we'll, gets his feeling we'll hurts take, really <laughs> easily. So <laughs> we'll take any <laughs> any feedback. Um, but anyway, Noah had contacted us. Um, and by the way, Noah, thanks for that mind numbing article on um, epoxy polymer chains and molecular structure and all that stuff. I did read it. Um, took a couple of naps. Uh, I think probably <laughs> while I was reading it. But uh, anyway, the article was good. It did explain why 30-minute um, epoxy doesn't get brittle like 5-minute epoxy can. Um, and it has to do with molecular chains and the and the length of them and the longer chains are more stable. So therefore, they are less brittle and on and on and on. But anyway, what wow, I really... kind of like I feel now. Yeah, exactly. Okay. That, exactly. Um, but really what I wanted to uh, talk to talk about Noah about was he uh, he asked us about a Pettigrew uh, Twin Otter 480 project that he was building. And that was really more up your alley, Ron, because this was a twin electric project that he was talking about. Okay. So he, he kind of wanted to know um, some things to avoid when building from plans and what your advice would be for setting up a dual, you know, a twin 480 electric airplane. Well, if you're building from plans, uh, be okay building a wing three times. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it might not happen, but just be okay making Hopefully mistakes. It won't happen. Uh, be okay making mistakes because it's going to happen. That's for sure. Um, and the beautiful thing about balsa is if you make a mistake, easy to fix. And usually fairly inexpensive because you don't normally mess up a whole, whole huge thing. Right. Um, unless it's a you, wing. Unless it's a wing. But you shouldn't have to build three wings. No. Um, that, I feel, was my mistake. But I've learned that I won't do that again. I will take some credit for, for, for one and a half of those. <laughs> <laughs> um, as for setting up dual electrics. So what I did... Um, I ran them both, like both of the speed controllers and engines, off of a single battery. Uh, my plan originally was to use two batteries, but I could not make that physically work uh, with the setup I had. Um, ideally, I would have gone with two batteries just for the whole flight time thing. Mm -hmm. um, but with the single battery setup, I ran, uh, you know, batteries obviously get into a Y harness, mm -hmm. and then that powers each of the uh, speed controllers which powers the motor. Mm -hmm. The speed controllers each went into a separate channel. Now, you can run it uh, if you want just on a Y harness on that and use a single throttle channel, but I like to have a little bit more control if I need to over, you know, endpoint adjustments and all that kind of oh, stuff okay. with the motors. Yeah. Normally, you don't have to do anything, but I just like having a little bit of redundancy built in. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you... I'm sorry. Sure. So you would you would mix the two channels together then? Yeah, I did a mix on oh, the. Okay. I think it was oh, the yeah. gear channel since I didn't have gear. Just did a mix of that to the uh, yeah. to the throttle. Nice. Um, because of that, you were or I was able just to to run the power back into it, and I didn't have to worry about cutting one of the power leads off of the uh, uh, what not Dean's connector. What's the the uh, JST plug? Yeah. If you're running two batteries, one of them is going to be powering your radio, the the receiver in there with a BEC. So with that, um, pick one to do that. And then your other one, you're going to have to cut the power cable to it. Mm -hmm. So the, the power cable that runs from the other unpower... Hold on. How do I want to say that? So one ESC will, will power your receiver. Yeah. And so you'll have to disable that lead off the other ESC because you don't want to overpower. You don't want to double the power into the receiver. Well, it's not necessarily doubling the power into the receiver as much as it's uh, signal quality. So oh, like you, okay. you're, you're, you're going to have different grounds and usually with ground, you want to have a common ground. So if you can't have a common ground by using two batteries, mm -hmm. um, it's best just to cut one of the leads off on that. Okay. It's not going to hurt anything. You know, all you need to get out of there is going to be the, the signal anyway. So that's what hmm. I would do. Okay. Um, 
hopefully that made sense. If not, reach out and I'll try and yeah. try and uh, answer that a little bit better for you. But uh, yeah, that's what I did so on you, mine. You talked about mixing uh, the two channels together. This little uh, cheapo radio that we're going to give away. Yeah, it has three programmable mixes in it, so you could do that with this radio. <laughs> That's By the awesome. Way, just saying. Yeah, very good. <laughs> what else you got? Anything? Yeah. Um, so a couple of episodes ago, we we kind of broke down the remote ID um, mm-hmm. uh, and how we can, you know, how how I feel like it's better than it was. Um, it's still not ideal, but uh, better it's something could have been. Yeah, something I I feel like I can live with. Um, I did get a, uh, I, I was contacted by Jonathan, um, who had some valid concerns of his own, uh, even with the new, uh, layout. I don't want to read, uh, the whole email. Um, but I do want to address the, uh, the one concern that he had about, um, a patent that had been applied for and granted, uh, to a, an individual that is in the drone industry and a designer of drones. Um, and his concern was that, uh, that this patent was going to, basically put a stranglehold on anybody developing technology for the um, the uh, the remote ID device that we can retrofit to our older airplanes and is concerned that it's going to you know become cost prohibitive and you'll be buying from you know one a sole source for that who can just charge whatever they want for this um, it's a valid concern it is it absolutely is and however and on the surface um, that's exactly you know, that was my first impression also. Right. Um, so I did some more digging, uh, so a lot of reading, and I went out and I actually looked at the patent that, uh, that was, uh, uh, approved for this Granted, individual. Yeah. And, uh, upon reading it, um, and looking, looking closely at, at, at the verbiage and the, and the technical jargon that's in it, it's very, very broad and general and really, um, it's a patent for really the idea of uh, using some sort of a broadcast as opposed to an internet connection to accomplish remote ID. So basically the, the patent allows the use of Bluetooth, wireless, Wi-Fi, whatever kind of broadcast technology you want to want to use – locally, um, that's what the patent really is about. The patent really doesn't cover any, to, to any great degree, uh, the technical aspect of how that's going to be accomplished. So it's still going to be open for competition. I mean, you know, manufacturers are, are always, you know, they're in the business to make money. Um, and the only way to do that is to be competitive in the marketplace. And so, Developing a remote ID device that we can retrofit to our airplanes is going to be, in fact, Horizon, if, if you are uh, subscribers to Horizon's newsletters, they addressed it in just a, in like one or two newsletters ago, how they're already working on designing remote ID devices. So I understand Jonathan's concern, and I was concerned too when, like, on the face of it, when I first looked at it, especially granting, you know, this, this, uh, uh, patent to somebody who's in the drone industry, oh, certainly that spells disaster for us regular, you know, RC <laughs> airplane guys. Um, but but the but the uh, the patent is actually very very general in nature, and it it allows for for competition. And in addition to that, something you discovered. Yeah, he's a hobbyist. Yeah, the guy that uh, got the patent is a hobby is a RC airplane guy also. Yeah. So. Um, Sure, he wants to he wants to make money in the industry, but he also doesn't want to kill the industry that makes money for him. Yeah. So, um, uh, Jonathan, I understand your concerns, and uh, and like I said, on the face of it, I felt that way also. But after reading it, and I think you'll find too if you if you kind of dig into it, um, there's plenty of room for competition in the marketplace, and I don't think they're going to price us out of out of the out of the hobby uh, with this device. So. That was all I wanted to say about that. Yeah, time will tell, but I've not right. seen anything really that's concerned me too much. Yeah, and, and like we're still doing this. If if I thought the hobby was going to end, <laughs> like if I thought the sky was falling, we would have thrown done. in the towel and not done this anymore. <laughs> right. So, right, we're still here. Don't worry, people. Yeah, sky's and, not falling. And we got we're good. Time. We still have time. I mean, yeah, uh, the implementation. We worked out the dates. It's it's quite a ways away. Yeah, uh, so we can enjoy the hobby, even if if worst case scenario <laughs> happened. We would still have several years to yeah. enjoy what we're doing. So, well, a few um, years. I wouldn't but say it's not, several. I, I promise it's not going to come to that. Nope, it doesn't seem like it. No, and it so. doesn't seem like that's the plan. So. Nope, nope. So that's all. I that's all I wanted to to okay. talk about with Jonathan's uh, reply there. Do you have anything else you want to talk about? 
Uh, no, I just want to remind uh, our uh, viewers and listeners and our, our patrons that we're going to be giving away this radio here, uh, hopefully, if everything goes as planned, like maybe the first or second week of April. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to thrash it, and I'm going to give it to Ron, and he's going to thrash it, and we're going to put it through its paces. But uh, um, you can look forward to a, uh, a review video on our channel. Uh, pod uh youtube channel uh very soon uh hopefully i'll get to fly with it maybe even as early as this week uh so you can look forward to that that'll be coming we're going to give that away if you're not a patron yet patreon.com there's a link on our web page uh become a patron rcplanelab.com slash patreon yes thank you very much or patreon.com slash rcplanelab oh either way there you go there you go options (laughs) all right cool anything else uh no that that'll do it for me well then until next week i'm ron and i'm tom Good night. Good night.